to open your Bibles, if you would, please, to 1 John, chapter 3. We've been continuing to um, meander through 1 John, uh, kind of section by section, and today is no exception. We're going to pick up on another uh, couple of verses and um, see what God has for us as we, as we do that. So let me lead us in a word of prayer, and then we'll, we'll look into this word. Father, we're so grateful that you are a God who does not fail us. No matter what the circumstances, no matter what happens, you are still God and you are still there and you still work and minister in our lives. Even when we fail you, you do not fail us. And so we are so grateful for that. We're also grateful, Father, for the love that you have for us, a love that is so deep that you literally gave your own son that, to die that we might have everlasting life. You desired that relationship with us so much that you allowed him to die and he died voluntarily to redeem us to be that sacrifice for all time uh, that we might have a relationship with you and not only a relationship in this life but also an eternal relationship with you uh, father help us to just continue to allow our lives to sink deeply into that truth uh, and allow it to impact our lives uh, so father we look to you this morning and we look to your spirit to lead us and guide us as we look into your word uh, would you teach us this morning that which you have for us? Would you convict us of what we need, need to be convicted of? Would you comfort us where we need to be comforted? Strengthen us where we need to be strengthened? And just be there for us in, in uh, all ways that you are. And so we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. First John chapter 3, beginning in verse 11. Uh, we looked at the first part of chapter 3 last week. Uh, we'll look at the next uh, several verses. We'll be reading through verse 18 uh, this morning. So, for this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life, uh, eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought also to lay down our lives for the, uh, for the brothers. If anyone has, a, has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. It's God's word. Some tough words, huh? Uh, I think someone else should maybe come and do this one. <laughs> these are tough. These are tough words for us. They're uh, at just the initial reading. There's just a lot there, and it's kind of scary. Some of it, because some of it seems to create some either-or situations that we tend to be a little bit uncomfortable with. There's just, and not only that, we live in a world where we throw this word love around so freely and so flippantly so that it's, it's possible to love your wife as much as you love an ice cream cone. Um, and I uh, won't get into that comment, but uh, it's just we love everything or we love nothing. It's just we throw this around so easily. And the, the scriptural version of what that love means, this word that means agape out of this, out of this particular text, is a word that is so rich with meaning, but it's so deep that it's difficult for us to grasp in this day and age all that that means for us, because we have to get we have to get past some cultural uh, concepts of it before we can really understand it. But the truth is that just as the just as blood is the circulatory system of the body, love is in many ways the circulatory system of the church. Uh, it all kind of boils down to. Love, that's what kind of keeps the whole thing going. And I know there's that song that love keeps the world going around and all that, whatever that is. Obviously, I don't know that song. Um, but the, the truth is, in the church, this is, this is what it's all about. It's God's love for us, our love for one another, our love for God. Spiritual cardiac arrest. And some churches, as we know, 
uh, and I know of some, where the love has grown cold in the church, not only love for God, but love for one another. And instead of loving one another, there is constant bickering and constant fighting and constant uh, just at one another's throat. And eventually, a church like that eventually just simply fades away and dies. Because it can't exist without the love for one another. It's that important. And they have, and I know of one church that I'm thinking of in particular that really had the, the spiritual heart attack. Uh, the, the love was gone and it just, it almost, it looked like the church was going to die. And it went on ICU and it went on all of these things and eventually God was able to bring it back again and it's back on its feet and we're very grateful for that. But that doesn't always happen. Some churches simply die when the heart attack comes. And often it's because we just can't get along and we can't demonstrate our love for one another, or maybe we just quit loving one another uh, in the process. And John, in this, in, this, in this epistle to us, in this letter to us, speaks very directly and very uh, forthrightly about what we need to do, what this needs to look like. So uh, just a fun little topic for the day. We're going to dig into it. He basically breaks this down into four things that we're going to look at. He looks at love from these four different contrasts or examples, one or the other. A murder, hatred, indifference, and Christian love. They're all here. They're, it's kind of the outline of the whole thing. And I think there was a slide on that, but maybe, maybe, maybe not. I did the slides a while ago. Um, don't worry about that. We'll get to all of them. We're going to look at those four things really under two main headings. <laughs> so it's going to be, it's not complicated, it's just you'll, you'll follow it as we go. But we're going to look at our love for one, one another as it's contrasted with the example of Cain in the world, and then we're going to look at our love for one another as demonstrated in the example of Christ. So in these verses, he gives us two big examples, two very different examples, the example of Cain and the example of Christ. And in doing so, he looks at love from the aspect of Murder, hatred, indifference, or Christian love. There, there aren't a lot of options for us. And that is, I think, the part, as I was studying this this week, that is the part that is kind of, it's kind of scary when, when you look at it from, from just a human standpoint. It can look a little scary. But let, let's look at it. Let's, let's dig into it and see if the Spirit of God has some things to say to us this morning regarding these things. The first thing that he talks about in these verses is... The, our, our love for one, or one another as it's contrasted with Cain and the example of Cain. I love the way he starts out. He says, for this is the message you've heard from the beginning. The word message there you could translate into the word gospel. So this is the gospel you've heard from the beginning. This is the message. This is what it has been from the beginning. In other words, John is, is telling his readers, I'm not telling you anything new here. Uh, there's, there's no great new revelation in this. You've heard this. This is the same message we've been preaching since we started this whole thing. How important love is, how important it is to, to not have hatred in your heart, but to have love in your heart, all of these things. So John chapter 13, you, re you remember those verses in 34 and 35, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you Love one another. It's a message that Jesus spoke. It's the message that came ultimately from the prophets. It came all the way. It's, come, it's the message of all of the scriptures. We're to love one another and we're to love God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. The two great commandments. Jesus said you can, you can wrap everything up in the scriptures in those two things. Um, it's just that it just isn't that easy to do, right? Uh, because we get in the way. Uh, so he goes back and he gives us this example of Cain. And if you've studied the Scriptures at all, or if you've read through the Scriptures, you know that, that the Scriptures remind us that we're not only to think rightly, we're to act rightly. And we go back to this issue of Cain. We should not be like Cain. Uh, it's, it's not a good thing. You remember... It's interesting, the first two children born on earth, Cain and Abel, and one of them killed the other. And we wonder why we have issues yet today. There were only the two of them, uh, but one of them, as you recall the story, uh, same parents, brothers, we don't know how old they were when all this happened, but 
They were the two of them. They both brought sacrifices to God. One accepted the one and not the other. Why, we're not entirely sure. We have everything. The commentators basically boil it down to saying, for some reason, uh, the one was acceptable to God and the other one was not. One followed the rules, one did not. Apparently, they both knew what the rules were. They knew what they were supposed to do. One followed, one did not. God accepted one, did not accept the other. He accepted Abel's, he did not accept Cain's. And Cain became angry. And you can read the story back in Genesis, or the back chapters of Genesis. He saw that his uh, sacrifice was not accepted. He didn't blame God. He blamed Abel. Interesting. I'm not sure why. Uh, and when he had an opportunity, he demonstrated who his real uh, source of life was, which was Satan rather than God. And he rose up and he killed and he murdered his brother. Unless we think that was just something that just sort of happened, uh, the word that is used, the words that are used in the text to refer to murder, it's probably good the children aren't in here, it means to butcher or to slaughter. Literally, it means to cut one's throat. So this was not just a, you know, uh, I'm going to suffocate you with the ground or something. He rose up and literally slashed his throat and slaughtered him. Uh, where, did the, where did they get the idea to do that? Uh, I'm not even sure they had been slaughtering animals yet at that point. Uh, so Abel died a violent death at the hands of his own brother. And what, what John goes on to tell us is that you need to understand that he did that because he was of the devil. That came in early. The whole issue of which, which kingdom do you belong to came early in, our, in the history of mankind uh, and came, I suppose, even with the, uh, Adam and Eve and their, and their sin. So three questions that, that, that he asks and answers. Where did, where did Cain come from? The evil one. We, we should not be like Cain who was of the evil one. Uh, the source of where he was. Now, where are all of we before we come to know Jesus? Got in the same boat. Uh, although Noah hadn't been around, so there wasn't any boats yet. But we're in the same boat. What did Cain do? He murdered his brother. And why did he do it? Scripture says because his deeds were evil. We're talking about someone who was from the beginning evil and of the evil one. And John is telling us, if you look at the, the, this test of love, if you want to look at it that way, Cain failed. He did not love his brother. Now, did Abel love his brother? We don't know. We don't know the answer to that question. But we do know that in this whole issue of, of murder, Cain hated his brother, and that's where this murder comes from. Why do we have so many murders in our world today? It's not good people killing each other. It's because the world is evil, sourced in the devil. Um, we can get into all the psychology of it we want to, and, that, and that's, I'm not saying that that's a bad thing to do. But the bottom line is they, this is done because their deeds are evil because they're of the, of the evil one. So the solution, at least in part, is people need to be redeemed. That's the ultimate solution that seems so obvious but is often so overlooked. He goes on to, to say, certainly he's, not, he's, not, he's indicating that we should not be like that. I mean, that's kind of obvious uh, in the text. I think he's not indicating that we should be of Cain. We're not. He's reminding these people that they're not, and those deeds are evil. So he says, don't be surprised then, brothers, when the world hates you. So he shifts a little bit from the whole issue of murder to now looking at hatred and how that relates to murder. So he's, he's saying, when the world hates you, don't be terribly surprised. Why shouldn't we? Be? Even Jesus said, if the world hates you, just don't forget, it hated me first. Uh, don't be surprised if the world hates you. Why? Because evil does not like righteousness. They're, they're, they're on opposite poles. And so his, his conclusion is, this whole issue of hatred, don't, don't be surprised when the world hates us. We want that the world should love us, right? 
Why don't they like all of our stuff and all of our, why don't they like our Jesus and why don't they like our ethics and our values and all of these things? Why does the world keep shifting away from these things? Because the world hates us. Now, it isn't that they hate us so much, it's that they hate Jesus. They, they hate the righteousness because darkness does not like light. Evil does not like good. It's just, it's just the way it is. And so we have, to be, we have to understand that for the same reason that Cain hated Abel, so the world hates the good. Don't be surprised if the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding with him. Those are fun. It's the challenge. What, what he's saying is we don't, even as believers sometimes, we fall into the, the, the hatred part of things, don't we? Get, it gets us. Uh, it's, it's not who we really are, but it, it, it can take hold of us. Um, and John is warning us to be careful about that because we have passed from death to life. We have passed from the kingdom of the devil to the kingdom of God. We've passed from one to the other. We're no longer a part of that, and yet we still sometimes feel the influence of it or the impact or the effect of it, and sometimes it washes over and it sucks us back in for a while. And John is saying be very, very careful of that because if that begins to happen and it happens too much and too long, John is going to say, you maybe need to ask yourself, have I really switched kingdoms? Which kingdom am I really in? And I, that's not a, a fun one to, to talk about. One of the commentators uh, said this, the fellowship of Jesus has no promise that it will ever be in the majority. We must indeed guard against thinking that there can be, ever be any kind of human security or assurance against the world's hatred. All parleys, all tr truces, all peace treaties are unreal, for the world must hate the Christian fellowship. And because of the fellowship, so long as it is a Christian fellowship, cannot hate, it must suffer at the hands of the world. The motto of the community of Jesus is, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed. It, it, it is indeed a conquered world which seeks to terrify us. It is indeed a condemned and dying hatred which attacks us. We sometimes forget that we're in completely different worlds. And that the world will continue to hate us. The Bible is filled with that contrast. I think the scary thing is that there are those that at times have maybe are part of an organization called church, but not a part of the kingdom of God. If you understand what I mean, one, one author said this, to pass from death to life is to experience the permanent change from the state of lostness to a state of being saved. Did you catch that? A change from being lost to a state of being saved. And then he goes on, he says, spiritually dead, though respectable. Dead, though honored of men. Dead, though positioned in places even of spiritual power. Spiritually dead, though educated and cultured. Dead, though decent and satisfied with an outward form of godliness. Dead, because of the rejecting of God's Son and Savior. We can look saved and not be saved. The gospel brings not just how we think we are, it brings actual change into our lives. And so what, what he is saying here is this hatred becomes an issue. Uh, if you remember the Beatitudes and then the Sermon on the Mount, remember what Jesus said? You've heard that it was said from of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry, a better translation would be probably be hates, would hate his brother. Anyone who's angry with his brother or hates his brother will be liable to judgment. 
So what John and what Jesus are both saying is we need to be very careful because hatred very, very quickly can turn into murder. Now, I've, you know, we, we have people, I think to myself, could I ever actually murder somebody? And I think, well, I don't know. But then, but then you know, like many of you, I've watched enough Perry Mason and Murder, She Wrote and Matlock and all of those others, Law and Order, to know that there is a tipping point, isn't there? There can be... You can push a person just so far. On TV, you have to do it in an hour or two, but it, sometimes it takes a lot longer. But we, we don't know. What we do know is, and what we seem to be fairly clear of, is that hatred is kind of the first step in that whole process that leads to murder. I don't know very many people that murder people that they don't hate. Uh, now, it could happen accidentally. I mean, there's accidental murder. There's accidental deaths and so on. But hatred is an intense emotional feeling, it's, one person said, it's the desire to get rid of somebody. Hatred is a desire to get rid of another person. I hate someone, the, the feeling is so strong that I just wish they would just go away. Have anybody ever, done, ever had that in your life? All right, be honest. I don't think, let's see, I don't think any of you, but... Uh, there, there are those times, aren't there, there are, we, get, we just get, I just wish they would just leave and just leave me alone. I hate them so much. What John is saying is that emotional feeling is the first step. Now, most of the time, 99% of the time, it doesn't lead to murder. But in our minds, I've come up with some creative ways to get rid of people. I won't go into them. Um, won't make a YouTube video on that, but... We've, the question that is often asked, and I remember even sometimes with our own children in, in, in seeking, what, what Jesus is seeking here is motive. And so oftentimes, even with our kids sometimes they are growing up, it wasn't, it wasn't just asking them, what have you done? But what did you want to do? Both can get us in trouble. But sometimes we have, Jesus often will look at us and go, not, I'm not just interested in what you did, what, the, what sin you committed. I'm interested in knowing what did you want to do? Because that gets to the heart of who we really are. Um, when Jesus passes judgment on our actions, he looks first at the motive behind the act. If your heart is right, he is long-suffering with us, even when our deeds are incomplete or flawed in some way. But if our heart is wrong, none of the spiritual acts can ever be pleasing to him. It gets, it gets to the motive. We can do some great things for the totally wrong motive. And Jesus doesn't think much of those. We can mess up sometimes, but have a heart that is right. And God is long-suffering. Murder and hatred. What he says is, in this sense, what he's saying is, this is sort of a test of where, where you are in the family of God. If you find yourself almost always hating and, and thinking evil and wrong, you, you, you need to go before God. Maybe repent that. Uh, if we have it from time to time, we need to do that. And, and even now, there's times that I think to myself, are there people that I need to kind of forgive or are there people that I need to let off the hook that have wronged me? Do I, do I need to do that? Because that's an act of, of obedience, as we'll look at in, in a few moments. But where are we at with, with that? Not moment by moment, but long, longevity. What is the motive of our heart? Uh, where does that fit? And John is saying the, the hatred, the murder, that motive does not belong in the family of God. It'll destroy us. It'll cause, organizationally, it would cause an, eventually a spiritual heart attack. The second thing he says in here, spend a little bit of time on these next couple ones, is that our love for one another is demonstrated in the example of Christ. Uh, I mean, that's the example we ought to be looking at, right? Uh, we ought not to be looking so much at uh, Cain, but at Christ. We all know John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, begotten son, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have ever everlasting life. We know that one down well. But I also like 1 John 
Uh, have you looked at that one? You can. It should be right in front of you. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. The demonstration of the greatest demonstration of love was what? The cross. We know that Jesus at that moment voluntarily, sacrificially, substitutionally laid down his life for us. There's no greater demonstration of of love anywhere than the cross. All right? That was pretty weak. But um, (laughs) anyway... um, his death was voluntary. Nobody pushed him to the cross. It looks like, if you read this, the text sometimes, it looks like the Romans and the, and the Jews got together and crucified him. But the scripture is very clear that Jesus said, yeah, it, it may look like that, but the truth is I voluntarily did this. I laid down my life. If I hadn't wanted to do that, they could not have done it. And so he, he voluntarily laid down his life knowing that he was doing so in our place. Because we're the ones that deserved that. He did not, and he did that for us. There is no greater demonstration of love. And there are times through history where we have seen and read of other people who have substituted their life for the life of someone else in order to save them, uh, physically in order to save them, to stand in the way, to take the bullet, so to speak, for someone else. And we we honor those. Uh, But the truth is... There is no greater demonstration than that. Than that. The great theologian Karl Barth, a, a theologian on the continent, uh, came to the States one time. This was many, many, many years ago. Uh, came to the States and spoke at one of the seminaries. I can't remember which one. Um, well, I wasn't there. I read it and I forgot what I read. So that, just so you think, was he there? No. Um, and someone in the Q&A time afterwards, he'd given this great lecture on, on some theological thing. And he got done and had a Q&A time with the students. And one of the students asked him, said, Dr. Barth, could, could, you, could you boil down what would be the core of your Christian belief? What, what, I mean, if you boil everything else down, pull everything else out of it, what is the, the core belief that you have in your Christian life? And this great theologian thought for a few moments, and then he said, I think it would be this. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. That was it. And, and there is, we learn that song as kids, at least I hope I still learn it. Uh, we learn that, that little song as Jesus loves me, this I know. We learn that as kids, but it, there is no greater truth, even for those of us who are getting up there than that truth. Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. All of the great theologians, all of the great theologies are built on that truth and that reality. Rarely will we be called upon to give our lives for our brothers. In fact, only once would it ever be required uh, because if you did, you would be gone. Think about that for a moment. Anyway, Um, rarely will that ever happen. But Jesus has done it for us, and it's the outworking, the willingness to do that that John is talking about. How how far are we willing to go for our brothers and sisters in Christ and even those in the world? And so he talks about this, this great example, and so we've talked about murder and hatred. He gets into this next part, which I think is one of the most troubling um, troubling parts of our Christian life and something that I think we really, I want to be careful how I handle it, but I think we really need to deal with it in our Christian lives in this day in which we live. And it's this issue of indifference. Look at, look at what he says in verse, uh, verses, um, well, mostly verse 17. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? It's a sobering, it's a sobering verse if you think about it. He's not talking here about people who are extremely wealthy. He's not talking about the upper class of society that has 
You know, their bank accounts are huge and, and all of that. He's talking about average, ordinary people who have enough to be comfortable and enough to give some. So he's talking about most of us in this room. And he says, if we have some of the world's goods and we see somebody in need and we don't care, how, how can you claim to love Jesus? That's what he's saying. Um, it kind of gets, it, it gets into, there's a side issue that gets into this because we get into also the issue of loving versus people, maybe versus liking people. Because when we talk about this whole thing of Christ and world's goods and seeing people in need and all these things, we get, we get into not just how we love someone, but whether or not we like someone. Now, um, I don't know about you, but I don't, I don't like everybody. You can edit that out of the tape. Uh, do you? I mean, be honest. No. Uh, there's probably a few people in here that really don't even like me, and that's okay, because there's probably a few people in here I don't like either. Um, I don't think so, but maybe if I knew you better. Um, there's a difference between, um, you know, there's, maybe put it this way, liking is a matter of personal preference. Loving is a matter of obedience. And th- that's, why th- that's why I'm leading into this. I'm kind of backtracking to get into what he's really talking about in this passage. Um, you can like... I think we, we, prefer, we prefer to be around certain people. We learned, for instance, a long time ago, we have a group of people that we like to travel with, and we've been to Cambrian, we've been on cruises, we've done stuff. We like to get together and play games and eat and, and all those things, and they're, they're a lot of fun. Um, and there have been from time to time people that have kind of wanted to invite themselves into the group. Well, one or two made it, but it, you, not everybody that wants to gets in. That sounds cruel, and if any of you guys are listening, I'm sorry, but uh, uh, I don't think they listen to my sermon. So, um, because we all get along. We, we all like the same things. We, you know, we just, there's a connection. That isn't true with everybody. It doesn't mean I don't, that I really dis- dislike people. But I learned, we learned, early in our married life, we learned that there are some people that we like enough to travel with, and there are some that we like enough not to travel with. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, you want to find out if you really get along with somebody, take a trip together. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. We had one f- really good friend. We did a day trip together. We were barely speaking when we got back. Um, and we eventually worked it through. We just love the people. We just, you know, we just think different. That's okay. I don't think, I don't think God has a major issue with that. You can't, like, and not everybody can be in your dance card. I mean, you, you just can't quite pull all that off. So that's a, maybe a matter of personal preference. You have to be, you know, careful about a little bit of that. You don't want to demonstrate that you hate people. But, you know, you gravitate towards certain people, often people your own age and different things. So, I, that's okay. Love, but love has to at some point penetrate beyond that. There's, there's beyond the liking one another. There's the reality that even though I may not be drawn to you on every level, still as a person of the body of Christ, I, lo- I love you. There, there, because that's an obedience issue. That's a demonstration issue. That's how I treat you, how I care for you. And that's different than, than whether or not we want to go both eat in the same place. So understanding that, what he's saying here is we're not talking about having the world's goods and then helping people we like. We're not talking about just, okay, I just, I'll, I'll help you because we're both, we both are kind of the same. We'll help you out. He, that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about the body of Christ, how we are to love one another, which is a demonstration that has more to do with just talking about it and more, and more than to do with doing something about it. There was James who said, you know, be careful if you're just the type that goes, you know, somebody comes and need, has a need, and you go, well, be warm and be fed. You know, God love you, God bless you. And, and, that's, and that's that, and then send them away. 
If we have the capacity to help, if we have the ability to help, if we have the resources to help, and we simply choose not to, John says that is a problem. That's an issue that needs to be dealt with. There ought to be compassion and pity in the life of a Christian. If you have neither of those, we have a problem. We need to let that that sink in a little bit because God places in our heart a love for people. Now, we all do it differently. There's different ways in which we can do it. Some are introverts, some are extroverts, some are, 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 you know, some see need a lot quicker than others see need. Uh, Some see, uh, some of us have to be, you know, whacked over the head before we get it that somebody else needs help, and some just automatically see it. Uh, Some have a, a better capacity to come around and encourage others and do things. We all have our gifting. But what he's telling the body of Christ here is, if we see people, if we have the, the means to help somebody, and we don't, and we don't even have compassion, there's something wrong. Um, so let's get, I'm in this deep, let's, let's just get personal about this. Uh, on one level, I have, to con- I have to confess, I dread the, the, the coming year. It's an election year. Where that hits us as Christians, you know, there, there's just so many angles we could go, and I don't, I'm not going to spiritualize or get, or get into the, in, in using the pulpit for anything other than to say, with all of the stuff going on, I, don't, I don't really honestly don't care what you believe politically. That's your issue. Uh, but what I care about is when we see the, the people of the world being hurt by or impacted by decisions, and we have no compassion. So, for instance, um, oh, just do it. Um, <laughs> we drive up and down the, the, the streets and we see the tent cities. And, you know, we worked, Vicki and I worked in the inner city um, in Hollywood for 10 years. I, I don't know the answer to that. I, I, it's a huge problem. I don't know. I, it, it is a huge problem. I don't know the answer. I don't know what to do. Now, I've run into people that know exactly what to do, and I don't agree with you, but um, in most cases, because it's not that simple. What I don't understand is, is how we can drive by still and not have compassion. I, I may not know what to do. I'm, the little bit that I might try to do maybe doesn't make a huge difference in anyone's life. But how, how can, and, and there are some, some are, some are there by choice, some, you know, there's all kinds of things, but does it, not, does it not impact my heart at all to see that? Or does it just conjure up judgment and what they're doing to our city? And, da, 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 and I, I hear all that, and I hear that, and what bothers me is that I hear that in the church. I hear that from Christians, people who claim to love God, and look out on some of his people and go, who cares? Push them all somewhere else. And I think, I may not know what to do, but God help me if I ever get to the place where my heart doesn't want to. We see immigrants, you know, another huge issue. They come in by the hundreds, if not thousands. And I hear good Christians say, send them all back. I didn't ask for these people to come here. Get rid of them. And you say, but some of them, if they go back to their countries, may be killed. And I heard, I brought that up to one person. I heard him say, tough. I didn't ask them to come here. They get killed. That's not my business. And I think, oh, I'm mighty thankful that God didn't say, I didn't ask you to come to my cross. Get out of here. Go to hell. I don't care. Did God ever do that to us? No. No. Do we ever have the right to do that to his children? No. Do I know how to solve it? No. Do I think we ought to have rules and follow rules? Yes. But does it not break my heart? 
had a friend who pastored a church uh, out in the Rialto area and um, drove to church every morning. And as he drove to church, he drove by a U-Haul, a place that had several most likely immigrants, uh, many of them probably illegal, hanging out looking for someone to hire them to you know, help pack the U-Haul and that kind of thing. And they hung out there every day. And um, he drove by and didn't think much of it. And then one day he just got to thinking, I wonder what, what I could do. So the next day he, on his way to church, stopped and picked up a couple of dozen donuts and um, a couple of big thing crafts of coffee. And he just stopped and he just said, hey, you guys want some donuts and coffee? And apparently he was a little bit bilingual, so he got by, although I don't think you need to speak if you have donuts. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and coffee, I, th- I think you probably don't need to say much. And they, they took him and they were appreciative and he was appreciative and he went on to work. And he did that, he started doing that two, three times every, every week. He just stopped, bought donuts, bought coffee, stopped, got to talking to him. Their church had a uh, Hispanic um, ministry, a church service in, in Hispanic. Most of them were Spanish. And so he began to invite them and pretty soon some of them came and some came to know the Lord. The thing that disturbed him was that when, he, when people in the church found out about it, they were very unhappy with him. They didn't, they didn't think, because they, they said, why are you encouraging immigrants? Why are you encouraging these illegal people? Why are you doing this? And, and his answer was, he said, I, I don't know that I can solve their immigration problem, but, but can't I help find a way to solve their eternal problem? Um, can we not find a way to minister? Uh, when we were in the inner city in Hope Again, one of, our, one of the questions we did not ask was their immigration status. Uh, we just tried to treat people. You know, people that don't have a green card still need to eat. They still need food. still need clothing. They still need a place to stay. How can we claim to know God and care so little? about his people. Some think this means only the brothers, the brother here is a reference only to those in church. And if you're not in church, it does, this doesn't matter. And the preponderance of evidence is that this is certainly for the church, but I haven't run into a commentator yet who agreed that it was only, only Christians, only those in the church. The, the intention of Paul or of, of John was clearly that this was not only to be those in the church, but those outside the church as well. How can we withhold all of that? Um, It cannot just refer to just believers, though that is where it should probably begin. Had a conversation with, um, um, I look at Brian and then I think I'm probably going to get emotional, but um, uh, I can't find Darren, so I'm safe. But... um, (laughs) had a conversation and went out to lunch the other day with a former youth pastor uh, that he and I worked together in Santa Barbara for a number of years. He was, I was the pastor, he was the youth pastor. And we, um, we've just had a great uh, friendship down through the years. And we were talking, uh, sitting at Jersey Mike's, which is a great place to be, but, um, and just talking about the, the kids that had been in uh, the youth group when I was pastoring and when he was a youth pastor. And uh, some of a couple of them were one. At least one of my kids was in one of his youth, his, his youth group. And and um, anyway, we we're just talking about whatever happened to you know the that kind of story of where did they because they're all now you know they're all many of them are parents themselves and um, and so we just began talking about that and we we realized in the process that many of the kids that were in the youth group when we were when we were ministering there have walked away from the faith. Uh, they, they've, they've left it. Uh, they're not interested. Um, they become part of you know, what they call now the nuns, the NONES. The, they just have, they have no faith particularly. Uh, they're not walking with, with the Lord. And we both, we both got pretty emotional thinking about that reality and it kind of asking ourselves the question, did, did, did we do something wrong? You know, what, what happened? And that, that whole kind of thing. And what just was turned, what started out as just a really fun little lunch, let's catch up time, became a pretty serious, what can we do? 
uh, we've been praying for these kids. I've, been, I've known of some of them. And so we, we, both, we both realized that apart from one another, we hadn't seen each other for quite a while, we both had become more and more burdened with this group of, of kids and, and thought, what, what can we do? How can we demonstrate, and this message was in my mind as well, how can we demonstrate the love of God? How can we have compassion? What, what can we do to, to do something to, to encourage them to come back to the Lord? And we agreed to both keep praying and look for a way because we, we realized that probably in the world of, of spiritual things, we are probably the two voices that they would be most likely to at least give a chance to, to be heard uh, because they, they still like us and everything. But uh, they just have, have moved away from the faith. And I, and I think this is, what, this is what John, I think, is trying to, to get us to. If we, have, if we have the capacity and we have the burden and we see the need, how can we just walk away? How can we as a church walk away from the needs of a community? How can we just walk away from the needs that, we, that one another, even in the body, has? How can we do that and still, in some ways, still sleep at night, uh, still know that, that God is, is there? How can, we, how can we do that? And so he says, as he ends this in verse 18, little children, let us not love in word and talk, but in deed. And in truth, let's put some feet to our faith. Uh, let's not just talk about it. Talk is cheap and it's easy. Let's put some feet to it. Too often, we sit on the sidelines and we give lip service to the fact that we love everyone and we do very little about it. Um, we've We've done what I've called, we've, we've begun to put together the Association of Bystanders. Which would probably get organized if anybody would do it, but they're all standing by. Uh, but there, we just stand on the sidelines. Wait for someone else to do it. Uh, we don't want to get our hands dirty or our feet wet. But little children, let's not do it that way. Emmanuel, let's not do it that way. Let's get, let's get dirty. Let's get into it. Get our hands dirty and our feet a little bit wet as we go through it. William Booth, the founder of, of the Salvation Army, uh, sent a telegraph back when that was the thing to do. Sent a telegraph one time to all of the officers in, in the Salvation Army. It was a one-word telegraph. Telegram. It just said, others. That was it. Others. Maybe that should be our motto. Others. Not myself, but others. The story of the Salvation Army goes on. In, in May, on May 29, 1914, the ship, the Empress of the Ireland, sank. And on that ship that day were 130 Salvation Army officers, 130. 109 of those officers died and were drowned. And not one body of those 109 that was picked up, not one body that was picked up had a life jacket on it. You go, okay. Um, the few survivors that survived that, that um, sinking told how the Salvationists, as they were called, finding that there were not enough life reservers for all, took off their own life belts, strapped them around even strong men, and said this, which I think is kind of cute the way they said this. They said, I can die better than you can. In other words, I know where I'm going. I'm not sure where you are. You might need a second chance. I don't. Uh, and so they strapped the life jacket around them, and they drowned and let the other person live. From the deck of that ship, they shouted, Others others. As we look into a new year, how are we going to allow the love of God to be worked out in our lives? How are we going to work that out in the church? What, 
what deeds, beyond what words, what deeds do we need to do to fulfill this command from, that comes from the lips of John? Do you have the love of God in you? Are you his child? If you're not, if that, this all, none of this makes sense, then please, we would love, the first thing we would love to do is talk to you, enter into a dialogue with you about how you might come to know Jesus, how you might come into the family of God. Nothing would bring us more joy than to be able to do that. That's really what we're here about. But beyond that, what do we need to do to demonstrate the love of God? Who in your world, who in your circle of friends, acquaintances, business associates, who in that world needs to see the love of God in your life? What do you need to do to demonstrate that? Let me close with this, with this prayer. It was written by William Coffin, which is a really weird name, and I don't know who he is, um, but he wrote this prayer. He said, Lord, we have taken advantage of thy great unqualified love. We have presumed upon thy patience to do less than we might have done, to have been timid where we should have shown courage, to have been careful where we should have been reckless, not counting the cost. We pray now, O Father, to be used roughly. Stomp on our selfishness. Amen. If you'll stand, we'll have the, the benediction. I want to just close it, leave it there for us to just continue to ponder. Um, but shifting gears, we want to thank you for being here this morning. It has been a delight to have you here and worshiping with us. If you are new with us, we do have a gift for you. If you find us at the welcome table, we'd love to give you that. We have classes that are going to take place in a few moments. We invite you to those. Uh, and to become a part of all that we're doing here at Emmanuel. Uh, we're grateful that you are here. And now let me close with this benediction. And now may the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each of us now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you so much for coming. Have a great, great afternoon.